18, right? Uh, the general consensus was to wait for Mr. Kwajafa. Um, but um, I, I don't know. Should we... I've sent him a message, but um, the, he doesn't seem to be to be to be responding. Okay. Mm, I I'm, think we I'm should sending him message. Yes, sending him message. Yeah. yeah. Because he can join and maybe yeah. he'll speak yeah. last. Don't worry me. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Call great. Him. Yes, I think so. Um, we'll call him as well, and then we'll start. Okay. 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 Good evening, everyone. Um, thank Hi, you so much evening. for joining us. Good today. evening. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This is. Um, I want to start by saying this is a completely new experience for us, as I'm sure it might be for for some of you. Um, but um, this season, more than ever before, we felt the need um, to reach out to our community to um, be able to voice out our opinions and um, our thoughts and share from our insights on what we think the current, I mean, the current reality of our new new is, and hopefully, how to we can begin to forge um, the forge the future we hope to see together. Um, clearly, um, the Nigerian apparel and textile, I'm going to use apparel and textile manufacturing for the purpose of this conversation, just to sort of widen the scope a bit, because if I keep referring to fashion, it might just restrict it to what we see on the runway. But um, we're looking at, you know, the industry from, a, from, that, from that angle, from that value chain uh, perspective. Um, there, seemed to see, uh, there seemed to have been a semblance of hope before now in the sense that, you know, different, um, different groups, different unions were mobilizing either the government or private sector to be able to create some sort of, um, be able to find some sort of um, solution uh, to some of the problems, our pressing problems today. We've come quite, I, I think we've come a long way from talking about the problems. Yes, the problems still, per still persist. But I'm sure we'll all agree that whether or not we like it, there's been slight <laughs> noticeable change. <laughs> However, since um, our new reality that you know that we're all faced with today, which is the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which is, um, I mean, it's a human tragedy. It's um, it's a health crisis. I mean, it. I mean, words. I I can't even begin to ex express how you know. How that how it makes me feel sometimes because it's it's real that um, people are dying people have loved ones who you know who people there are people who've lost their loved ones there are people who cannot be with their loved ones this season and um, of course you know that's the first and first thing that's so real about this whole situation and then of course we now have to start asking ourselves the questions like you know so how does this affect us on a on the macro level and on the micro level. So uh, beyond our role as, you know, um, beyond our roles in our family, um, I guess a lot of people are, want to ask or find out questions around what's next, especially for an industry like ours that is still in, in its nascent stage, like everything is completely new and we're still struggling to pay our bills and, you know, pay our employees. We thought that instead of going straight into woven threads, which is our theme for the season, we have to re-strategize immediately that, you know, instead of talking about sustainability and where we believe our future lies, it's important to, you know, sort of take a, take a step back and ask ourselves some very relevant questions. What is the future? Um, how are we all going to cope with this? So the format is simple. We don't want to, I'm going to, you know, leave the floor open for, our guests to introduce themselves um, in no particular order. I'm going to um, ask Mrs. Ogunleti to start because her name her name popped up on my screen just now. So if we just you know okay. give introduction, tell tell okay. us a little bit about about you, what you do, and how your business contributes to the value chain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amoyemi. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's very nice to, to, to be here, and I must thank you again for always taking the lead uh, um, in these discussions. So I've been on this journey for um, a period of 35 years um, or a little more, uh, um, and I've seen all kinds of swings, and I've seen all kinds of government 
uh, um, regulation. So ours is a, is a story really of resilience uh, and we run two businesses. So we're not only in the, in the retail side, where, uh, with about 17 stores across the country. Um, we are also in the manufacturing side, which we have recently ramped up um, because we, we were projecting um, <laughs> for a very good 2020, given the talks that we've been having with um, the government on what needs to happen for the garment industry as a whole. So we, we play in the two sides uh, um, of, of, the, of the chain the retail end as well as the manufacturing end. So we're set up to contract manufacture for designers um, as well as, um, uh, um, as, well as um, uniforms for schools, for, for paramilitary, for whoever needs um, um, uniforms. So um, it's been an interesting journey. And um, well, the twists and turns of life has brought us here in 2020, but um, I think on the whole, we're resilient. We're resilient people and this too will pass. So that's what I do. Sorry, the, the, the name of the retail company is um, Rough and Tumble, manufacturing children's clothing. And um, the name of the garment manufacturing is Gatimo Apparel, um, which has manufactured for Rough and Tumble for the past 25 years. Um, so that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um... Jumake, I can you next on my screen simply because okay. you know, yeah. So, can you please? Yeah, an intro. okay. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be out, so to speak. Um, so, my name is Jumake Odwoli. I'm the special advisor to the president on ease of doing business. So, my portfolio covers the national and subnational interventions, business reform. Under the economic recovery and growth plan, the competitiveness pillar is divided into infrastructure, which covers roads, rail, power, broadband, and then you have the soft infrastructure, which is the ease of doing business intervention. So regulations, legislation, structural reforms, basically. So the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, which some of you may know of, has been implementing reforms since July of 2016. And we've seen some traction, but there's still a lot of work to do. Light manufacturing happens to be one of our core four areas of focus in 2020. So it's really a pleasure to join this conversation and see how we can support you in this uh, turbulent times. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Adwale. Um, I'm going to ask Yegua, please, uh, can you introduce yourself? Okay, um, hi everybody, good evening. Um, my name is Yegua Uko. And I used to run a concept store called Stranger. That's how I got primarily into fashion, the fashion industry. Um, it ran for five years, uh, closed down in 2018. And since then, I've been running a consultancy um, called New Type. Um, so we do systems. And we're very interested in the ideas that, um, or rather the idea that there are different ways of doing business here, different ways of organizing the various um, uh brands that we have the various organizations that we run um and maybe something that is uniquely african that we can present to the world you know? so um we do a series of workshops we also do um consulting with different kinds of brands not just fashion actually but also like cultural producers in general so arts um different kinds of design and so on um but yeah that's it thank you thank you so much Yegua. uh shala can you kindly let us introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Shola Babatunde. I'm the founder of OST College of Fashion and OST Garment Factory. We started over a year ago, over a decade ago, sorry, um, to train. We offer training, pattern drafting, sewing skills. We also offer training to garment factories. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we help um, factories to get staff and put structures in place. I also we also have our own factory where we offer contract manufacturing to companies, organizations, and even fashion designers that are willing to outsource their production to us, as well as we do the industrial um, uniforms or garments. <clears throat> so that's basically we're in two locations. We have a, a co-working space, a hub where we partnered with um, Sterling Bank and we're able to 
offered um, space to those who can't afford to have their own um, place to, to sow. And because of all this, we've also had to eventually put a temporarily you know, shut down so that we can re-strategize and come out stronger. Thank you very much, Shola. Um... Ayo, can you kindly introduce uh, yourself, Mr. Domotion? Hi, <laughs> can we see your face? <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you I don't not? think you want to. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, Miami. I thought you said it wasn't on video. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, 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 it's Zoom. It's, it's, it's I know, Zoom. but you said, I didn't think we were all going to come on. But anyway, you don't want to see oh. where I am. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thank you for setting this up for Miami. Um, so my name is Ayo Amisho. I am the executive director of Persianos Group and founder in Persianos Retail. We, uh, in the group, the property side of the business, we have six shopping centers um, and um, with about 400 retail stores altogether. On the retail, uh, PRL, which is the company that we founded in 2011, is a company that owns franchises like Hugo Boss, Puma, Lacoste, Inglot, uh, popular brands, Max, and we have our own brand, The Mix, which um, is a multi-branded store, which is set up to house local brands. So, um, yeah, well, our contribution into retail, as you see, and in the, the business is, is quite enormous. I'm excited about this um, talk. And I'm looking forward to talking about everything that's happening with us, all of us here with, as a result of the COVID-19. Thank you very much, Ayo. Um, welcome, Mr. Kwajafa. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us. Uh, we're just uh, introducing ourselves quickly and what we do. Can you kindly let us know, introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Herman Kojapa. I'm the Director General of Nigerian Textile Manufacturers Association. Uh, we are in textile production. And uh, BOI, BOI has given us some um, funds to retool our machineries, and uh, we are up to date now. Uh, the only challenge is that uh, we're having problems with the um, marketing. Our market is poor. That is why the federal government graciously Come up with exactly what our all three to see to it that um, we are able to uh, market our products. So um, the market is now a little bit closed due to smuggle items. So the ministries and uh, government. Wait, are we can't really hear you, sir. So there's a request yeah, from the, the audience the, the, that can you kind of. <laughs> yeah, so the government professors are trying to see how they can procure directly from the textile manufacturers through the executive order or three. So something is being done towards that end, and uh, CBN is assisting to link us up with the uh, defense ministry and other paramilitary authorities to buy the uniforms directly from the textile manufacturers. So along that line, something is being done to push in the market uh, challenge that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that introduction. Um, I think yeah. we'll go straight into into what we're doing, and it's we're discussing. We're starting with a with general discussion on key topics, I guess, that people want to talk about, and open it immediately to question and answer. So, um, generally speaking, the when we look at safety and the coronavirus in Nigeria, how can we begin to explore or have conversations around what we think the impact can be on SMEs, MSMEs, where, and I think we, most of us fall, it, fall within this category. Does anyone have thoughts or, you know, generally just um, maybe hands up if, if you want to contribute to it. And then we discuss that for about three minutes and then we go to the next, next topic. Hello. <laughs> Nobody wants to bite the bullet. <laughs> uh. Well, I'm happy to bite the bullet, but maybe I think people are, are sort of sober about 
the issue of, okay, we have to stay safe, we have to stay home. And a lot of people are wondering what that means. Of course, everybody has received the memo about hand washing and social distancing, but, but there's, a, there's a huge sense of anxiety about the future. If I think of my constituency, which is MSMEs across the country, my team and I have called over 200 SMEs this week to touch base with them. Uh, different parts of the country are, are at different levels of awareness of the, the gravity of the situation. And of course, Lagos is the epicenter. So um, I think it's a bit, there's a bit of apprehension of not knowing what the future holds about the disease, but even more so people already are thinking about, oh, I can't pay salaries. Am I going, I'm, I'm looking at having to lay off. I had to send my, my staff home. Um, and I think that is perhaps even more uppermost on people's minds than the thought of actually catching uh, COVID-19 at this time. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, there is, that, those are very valid concerns, I'm sure, and it's something mm -hmm. that we can all relate to. Um, so I'm, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but is there anyone that wants to talk about this and, um, you know, how it's generally affected their business or their operations? You know, I know it's affected everyone, um, but if you, yeah. yeah. I think what is, um, what is clear is that um, things are never going to, things might never be the same again. Um, I think what is clear is that we're in a crisis um, that requires for us to begin to think um, in a different kind of way. So um, for example, what my team and I are doing is what opportunities does this present to us at this point in time? And that's the question that we're asking. And how do we um, find, not only find the opportunities, but actually take the actions um, that will help us leverage on the opportunities. So the biggest thing I see is, um, and I am assuming that things, you know, things will get better because that, I think that's the prayer everybody has uh, and that Nigeria will not be as badly hit um, as the rest of the world um, because of the, um, physical distancing uh, and social distancing or whatever it is um, and of course all the washing of hands um, I think it, it's it's now becomes the entire global supply chain is has literally gone belly up so this has never been a better time to pro to promote by Nigeria this has never been a better time to reinvest in the garment and textile manufacturing sector of Nigeria. The one thing that is certain is that we all have to wear clothes. Nobody's gonna walk down the street naked. So how do we, we, we have to find a way of whatever trade agreements we have with China, we have to find a way in such that we are not at the, 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 the raw end of that, that there is an advantage to us and that we can actually revamp these factories, these textile factories to begin to use cotton that is grown in Nigeria or that can be sourced from the African continent um, as close to us as possible. And we begin to use that to do all the things that we require in terms of clothing, both industrial, domestic, uh, um, and every other every other use um, that fabric can be used for. So I think for me, yeah. the mindset that we bring to the table right now has to be a mindset of what's the opportunity here and how can we leverage on the opportunity? Um, because yeah, there's enough doom and gloom uh, um, right across board. I think definitely. now the smart thing is, um, wow, nice. and I keep telling you this, yes, I keep telling you this, Omoyemi, the sincerity of the intentions of the players as, as the, of the industry players, as well as the policy makers in making this work. This has definitely. never been a better time. It's never um, been a better time. Definitely, you know, and I never been a agree. better time. Um, and I'm going to jump in real quick because I think um, we all, we, one thing we all agree is that we've all agreed 
about is it cannot be business as usual. And um, we all have to think and strategize about, you know, and have conversations around the future that we hope to see. So when we talk about the future and, um, you know, that, that's where things get a bit blurry. For example, with Ayo Amushan, who is primarily, her business is probably based on importing things into, into Nigeria, which affects which can affect retail and of course can affect you know key players in the apparel and manufacturing <clears throat> sector because let's face it not everything nigeria doesn't produce everything that you need to you know produce your collections and Absolutely. all so it's um, yes, exactly. yeah, so it's very important to ask the to ask that sort of question so i'm going to throw this open to yegua and then ayo to please answer from that perspective yegua from sort of like the creative you know from the creative scene and all of that what do you think or where do you think the future lies? And Ayo, from your end, you know, in when we're trying to think of the future in terms of how the government can support the sort of business that you do, because both feed off each other, you know, we need, uh, there's got to be a careful balance between, you know, for retail to thrive in Nigeria. Of course, we have the manufacturers on one side who are, you know, trying to create business and support local business. And you also have that view that, yes, it's great to bring in brands, but you know, I don't want to. I don't want to share what your what your other vision is in terms of what you think the future or where the future lies. So maybe we'll start with Yegua, and then Ayo, you can tell us what you think. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Omoyemi. Um, for for me, one of the things that really stood out with, with all of this is um, how connected everything is. Um, mm. You know, we have a, a virus breaking out in Wuhan in China, but then the whole world is affected, you know, and not just um, affected on a healthcare level, but they're affected, everybody's affected economically, people are mm. affected socially. Now we can't go out, we can't interact with each other as we normally would. Um, there's a lot of um, behavioral stuff that has to change. And this connection is making me think a lot about um, how the industry can change or needs to change in the future, I think, mm. because um, a lot of things have become very obvious. One of them is that uh, I think fashion or let's say clothing, clothing industry can be pretty um, closed. You know, it's a very kind of like siloed industry where if you're doing fashion, you're doing fashion. You're not really connected to a lot of all these other industries, whether that's tech, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe you mm. come in on an e-commerce level, but you're not developing any, um, innovations in-house, you know what I mean? It's like you, you go and you, you take off a shelf to implement. Um, and to bring it into the, onto the Nigerian level, what I've been thinking about, at least what I'm hoping may happen for the future is that um, just like um, this is, uh, Mrs. Ogunesi said earlier about how this is a moment for us. Oh, sorry, that this, that this is a moment for us to be able to really start buying Nigerian and making Nigerian. Um, a lot of this now is now just that, look, um, we as an industry have to start thinking outside the box, right? It cannot just be, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to get my buttons from China and then mm. I'll buy, maybe get my silk or cotton from Turkey or maybe last, last, mm. I'll go to go and buy funtua from somewhere and I just make this, right? But then it's also about like, mm. you have to be able to build capacity in-house. So, I mean, it, it means that... Mm there's a lot more that has to go into building one of these businesses. It's not enough to just have the designs in your head anymore. Now you have to be thinking, you know, in a way that let us, let us say this tech startup kind of culture, you know, there's a very dynamic, very agile way of doing business that I think has to be incorporated in the textile industry as well, where, you know, where, where are all our textile designers, you know, um, even if we have locally sourced cotton, who is going to be able to make sure that that cotton can make contemporary things, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we need to do waterproof um, uh, coats or, or fabric to make um, raincoats and things like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to pause yeah. there because there's a huge sure. debate around that that I want to link where you're at now with what Shola, okay. what the question I have for Shola in terms of fabric and sourcing. But I want, um, uh -huh. Ayo, Ayo, can you please shed some more light on that in terms of your experience with I mean, for pounds, you have so many more dotted across Nigeria. I don't know, maybe about seven or possibly more or less. I'm not quite sure. That's and six. you've always had a dream, six. And you've always had a dream to incorporate, you know, multi-brand stores in the mall to encourage, you know, the local creative economy. 
So what has your experience been thus far? We try with the mix and how has that, you know, affected your vision to create a mall that caters to both uh, local brands and international brands at the same time, bearing in mind, you know, can you tell us a bit about that, your experience and how you- Yeah, um, you know, firstly, I want to say that it has, you know, with the international brands, working with international brands has become more challenging in the last, you know, few months anyway, before the COVID-19. And then after this whole it, the issue started and with the government policies, it's become a little bit more difficult. But this, you know, we, in every misfortune, there's an opportunity. And this mm. is why this time is quite exciting because it's a time for us to look more inward and focus on local brands. Even though I still feel it is as important to have the international brands as well as the local brands. But the opportunity is now for us to try and focus on trying to make sure that these brands work. We have worked, like we have a multi-brand called The Mix, where in the past we have worked with local brands, but the challenges have always been the same. And if there is a chance to be able to get to the stage where we can work on the infrastructure, the training, mm. the, yeah. all, the different, uh, certain things that we have had challenges with in with mm. the local brands, basic things like barcoding, product information, sizing, these things are, you know, um, it's unfortunate because the talent is there, but the, the, the support, the training, mm. you, you can't, in our business, you cannot reduce your standards just because, uh, no, you know, you want not. to take it. So you have mm. to, you mm. have, they, they have to, you have to make sure that these uh, designers or the local brands are able to get to that same level of standard to be able to push themselves on the, on the scale that we want them to be. So this, um, you know, these are the things that we face. But today, if we can, today is now, it is now time for us to, you know, work together. I don't know how we would do this or what legislative bodies can fund and support this to encourage these, um, the help with getting the infrastructure in place. Um, if, I may, um, um, if I may, if I may, um, bring yeah, me to... Okay. Sorry, Omoyemi, if I may, um, just on the back of um, what she said, um, the part of the, uh, um, of the challenge is, um, is that the industry is not as structured as it should be. So a lot of information that should be shared uh, or that can be shared doesn't get shared because there are no set standards of how um, the garment manufacturing industry operates in Nigeria. And we need to set these standards so that young people who are coming into the industry can work with those standards. We benchmark ourselves yeah. against international standards, not local standards. We must always benchmark ourselves against international standards because that is the standard to have, yeah? So what I would like to say here also is everybody is trying to come in as a designer manufacturing their own clothing. They don't have to do that. There are garment manufacturers who will produce for you so that you as a designer can focus on design, can focus on marketing, growing your brand, and you don't have to worry about getting your stuff made. The big challenge we all have, I see, is going to be accessories, for example. Where will they come from? Because yeah. nobody's, um, nobody's investing in that. You see? Definitely. So I think and, there's um, a lot we can do. And I would like to ask Mrs. Amusha, can you please reduce the rents and can we pay in Naira instead of dollars? <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. But for, get, I well, think I, you will see a, a lot I'm more local brands. I'm going to I agree with you. Sorry about that. Mrs. Amusha is going to reduce. I couldn't resist it. If she's going to reduce it, I guess she's going to, she's going to expect the government as well to give them some, you know, some, to give them a bit Absolutely. of a break. Absolutely. And I'm, so honestly, if they get a break, for that. then they can give us a break. Exactly. But, um, <laughs> honestly, I'm, all, I'm up for yeah, it. Hello? I agree. <clears throat> And that's no, why, you know. Note, Auntie, what hello, you're hello, is... hello, Moemi. Yes, yeah, please, we can yes, hear you. Um, um, actually, the issue is about um, infrastructure and enabling environment. That um, the benchmark between international and Nigerian standards, you find out that the cost of doing business is higher in Nigeria. Even though we have a committee on the ease of doing business, they're not looking at power. 
power gives us the highest cost. And uh, even up to now, the electricity has been planning to increase, continue increasing. We have the highest uh, per hour capita of electricity charge. Four cents being charged by, 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 by kilometer by kilo hour in, 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 in uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, Egypt, and even uh, Nairobi. So now and we are talking of uh, Africa doing business together. And our infrastructure cost is high, therefore production cost is high, and the price will have to be higher. And Most sorry, sir, beyond, that, beyond yeah. infrastructure co uh, costs, I'm even yes. worried that the textile manufacturing industries do not even have what we need. All week, um, yes. Shola, uh, yes. we've all been scrambling around trying to explore, considering the fact that for the very first time, it's like, you know, a father has been preparing his child or her child for this time, where you always have to look in what source locally, source locally, but for the first time, at least in my life, you know, um, yeah. border closures, um, you know, restriction on flights entering Nigeria. So for the first time, we find ourselves in this peculiar place where you have to source everything from Nigeria. If it's not in your market, you probably can't get it in, except the government gives you some sort of waiver. And whatever country you're bringing it from, they're probably on lockdown. So supply chain management, mm -hmm. the supply chain in the world as we know it mm -hmm. has just gone completely insane. Belly up. So now, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, to to bring it back to to bring it back home. So Shola, can you kindly share with us, you know, the frustrations this week around uh, the group, the different groups on, and silos that have been trying to rise up to probably look for how to support the government with production of masks and, you know, can you tell us how it's been frustrating not being able to find sector manufacturers who can manufacture polypropylene? Can you kindly share your experience with us and a bit of a frustration, it's okay, we can take it. And then hopefully well, we can all flag, take this don't flag, back. Don't flag to... has the fabric to produce the first half. <clears throat> okay, um, and, and we're in this, to everyone. We are in discussion um, with them. We're in discussion, we're in discussion with the government. Hello, mm -hmm. hello, sir. Please let me let me speak. So I've listened to everyone. I'm usually not a quiet person, those of you who know me, but I've listened um, to everybody's discussion. And I would say that I am, I don't want to say I'm happy because it's a, you know, it's not a happy time, but I am somewhat glad that this is happening and it has forced everybody to look inwards. Everything that we all thought is not possible has happened. All the laws have been broken, you know, especially starting with the border closure. I remember when I wanted to start manufacturing, everybody thought I was crazy. Why, do, why are you producing for other designers? How would you find fabric? How would you be able to do this? There's an issue of skill gaps. There's an issue of know-how like um, Auntie has mentioned about every designer wants to just do one part of the value chain. So we, that, which is one of the reasons why we started to train, to teach people that there are different value chains. You can be a pattern maker, you can be the designer, and then you, there are so many other accessories and so many things that you can do. Now, when all this happened, I got so many calls on, let's produce this mask in Nigeria. Then we started mm -hmm. to do the research of how to source the fabric. Nobody in Nigeria has the accepted international standard fabric. Note how I laid emphasis on that. However, we have substitutes that can be used. It's not just going to pass the, um, the surgical N95 you know, uh, yes. test. However, you know, so I called, you know, quite a few uh, manufacturer, textile manufacturing companies that are in our association, and they had said the truth. We don't have that exact fabric, but we'll see how we could I actually challenge them into getting a substitute that can be used. Hours later or days later, they called to say, yes, you know, we will be able to. So we found out that 100% tightly woven cotton can be used. Like um, Alaji Kwajafa said, there are quite a few factories that produce it. So some flag, woolen textiles, and um, he, you know, he'll be better at providing a list of those um, companies than <clears throat> I would be. But the issue is how with, with, with Lagos, Abuja, and I think Ogun State being on a lockdown, we all had to send our staffs home. So how would the staffs then come back 
they have to leave their houses, enter, there's even no transportation to come. Then we have to also make sure that they are tested to be sure that they, do, they are not carriers. Because I, I have this notion that Nigerians, we, have, we probably have a lot of carriers, but they are not showing symptoms. Maybe because we have a very high immunity, I don't know. But anyway, we need to be able to do that to even start to produce the mass. Without any iota of doubt, we have a lot of factories that can produce this mass to standard, provided we have the raw materials and everything else that we need to produce it. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, Mrs. Oduwale Jumoke, can you kindly advise? Um, we, I mean, across like three different groups or three different mm. that I'm sure, I'm not active in all, but passive to an extent, there's a clamor by a group of people who see this as well that, you know what, they want to do something. They feel a bit helpless. Like, okay, you know, we don't have the money to support, you know, all the efforts between the private and public sector to sort of alleviate what's going on you know, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but they want to donate masks. You know, I have young designers who are willing to donate fabric, who are willing to, you know, get one or two people working from their homes to do this. Unfortunately, for some reason, manufacturing, upper manufacturing companies don't fall within, you know, that, that waiver that can, you know, for, for, for us to be able to house them definitely on site. And like Shola said, to conduct all tests, but for them to be able to pro continue producing. Um, and you might want to ask, what are they producing if we're saying we don't have access to raw materials? But we're, we're, we believe that even if what we're starting to produce, uh, you know, what we call cloth masks or dust, dust, sorry, dust, dust, <laughs> dust masks, you know, it might, you know, in, in the next, we don't know where this is going, but we be, we're beginning to feel that we might get to that point where people might need to be wearing masks on a daily basis. Or, as I spoke to someone who operates Zaria Industries today, I don't know if she's on the call, on the call. They have, they're convinced, you know, they've come up with a solution and a prototype that can pass the test. But can the government support this? You know, I believe strongly that this can help the sector as well. While we're all on a downtime and everybody's at home, yes, the government told us we're home for two weeks. We're hoping it ends in two weeks that we can flatten the curve and the rate can begin to drop. But what if it doesn't? You know, so what other concessions, what other room can we have to maneuver to be able to get these factories, even if, you know, supporting with PPE in, in a way, to, to some extent. We saw um, it, there was a tweet going around that we shared, that was shared across groups. And some people were manufacturing in ABBA already, you know? But conversations were like, is that to the right standard or the right quality? So how can the government intervene with this? You know, either supporting supporting the manufacturers or the small designers who even want to contribute to what's happening today. Hmm. Okay. Um, Omar, I, mean, I think as, as the outsider from the industry here, I'm going to challenge all of you a bit more than that. So that's reactionary and that's great. But I want to take you perhaps a step back. I really liked the direction of the, the conversation, starting with Mrs. Ogunesi saying, this is a huge opportunity. We're looking at a situation where global supply chains have been completely disrupted. And frankly, I want to start at the end. The world is never going to rely on Asia yeah, as yes, completely. Absolutely as it yeah. has in the past. Yeah. And that leaves, where is, the, where is the, the last frontier, the least connected, the safest haven has been Africa. Africa. Mm. Well, that leaves a huge opportunity to plug in at least as a, as a plan B, because even if people start producing again in Asia, Asia is already picking up, China is already beginning to open its factories. So how should we then live? Because really the world is never going to be the same again. We're living history, no. basically. Yeah. And, and um, so, so we're, we're we going to face a couple of things. Okay. Yeah, we're going to face a couple of things. We're going to face lower demands um, as a country mm. now, because mm -hmm. we're oil dependent, we're going to face FX issues, or we're going to face supply, um, global chain, your supplies, your inputs, and we're going to face delayed FDI coming into the economy. So I want to start from the economy as a whole. 
Now there's been disruption uh, to the tune that uh, humanity has never seen in our I've lifetime seen. anyway. Yeah. We've seen disruption of movement of people across the world and of goods and in Nigeria. So we were watching it from afar till about two weeks ago. We've seen disruption in the way people work. And we've seen um, disruption in our own local supply chain logistics. We've seen payments disruptions. And we've seen disruptions, um, rent seeking behavior and harassment issues, even people that are trying to, to move against all odds. Now businesses, I told you, I've spoken with a couple of SMEs, a couple of hundred SMEs in the, in the past week, are under significant pressure um, on capital issues, inflows, outflows, working capital, stock inventory, raw materials, wage bills, um, service of bank loans, taxes. Those are the kinds mm -hmm. of issues that people, mm -hmm. including in this sector. Now mm -hmm. to take a step back, McKinsey re uh, released a report on Tuesday. I saw that. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. talking about the hits that the continent and the country may take and said that yeah. the biggest drivers of loss could be reduction from consumer spending in food and yes. beds, clothing yep. and transport. So you're yes. buying in the center of the storm and you have the opportunity. So what yeah. should we be doing about this? I loved, sorry, I didn't get your name, but I'm looking at your face right there. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just check. The word you mentioned, is exactly what has been ringing in my head. That's the Yegoa. Okay, yeah, Yegoa. <laughs> yes, okay. agility. How do we step back strategically to think about mm. agility? Shola has been mm. talking about it. Ms. Zogunesi, everybody has been talking about the same thing. The world has changed. How do we plug in? Now we know mm. that's now where we are now. We know the, the old challenges, the background. We know what the situation has been. The dominant economies, Bangladesh, Vietnam, India, mm. China, Done. we know. We know what the contribution of their apparel sector has been to their GDPs and where Nigeria is. We, we know those facts. Mm. We know that your sector has been growing. We know the contribution. We know, I mean, this is proudly made in Nigeria. We know that even consumer tastes have moved on and you've already started trying to going to large scale manufacturing, which is great. Now we, as government now, we know all the challenges. Um, Mr. Kwajapa, power, <laughs> ban on imported fabrics, uh, no big production hubs, durability of Nigerian textiles, no encouragement for policies, smuggling. You will agree that some of these have begun to shift. Shola mentioned the border closure. The government took a big hit but decided to take that decision because of businesses like hers. And yeah. it has been paying off, even though it's not, a, it's not a permanent fix. Now, where we find ourselves, and I can tell you all the government interventions, you can also go on to Business Made Easy. Um, that's our website, .ng. You will see all the relevant government interventions well, we've tweeted, we've put it on our Instagram page. It's on my Instagram page. It was a Mr. President's speech, CBN's interventions, FIRS interventions, anybody that needs the details, just uh, DM me and I'll send them across. My team is also on the call and we'll be sending and we can take questions. But now, private sector, preparing for the window of opportunity and plugging into the global supply chain by starting locally huge opportunity mm -hmm. for e-commerce, mm. for e-payments. Yes. Uh, as Yegoa said, I, I'm trying not to butcher your name, as Yegoa <laughs> said as well, not being in a silo, being mm. clued in on what other sectors are doing. Uh, mm. it, it's now a, a call to deeper maturity. Mrs. Ogunlesi said it, and this is not the first time I've heard her say it, about the sincerity of collaboration. I don't know what that means, but I'm thinking <laughs> scaling, organization I, and I will explain it to you later. Okay, if I look at those Asian countries and I told my team to start some research on this, I see scale, I see organization, very high level of organization, very high level of productivity in man hours, partnerships, 
specialization, maximizing local value chains, and really forging connections, which I believe is uh, exactly what is going on here today. So I'd like to throw that in and sort of expand the discussion beyond, yes, we can all react to produce masks, which we need for the public mm -hmm. health crisis, but mm -hmm. this industry is our priority for a reason. And we're really here to give all the support that is necessary to make sure you thrive. Because if this sector thrives, then the Nigerian mm -hmm. economy and indeed the African economy thrives. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. so can jumping in real quick, can we, okay. can we take a few can we take a few of the yeah. points and talk about it specialization stands out um yeah. you know ensuring sorry that what did you say Amoyemi? what stands out Speciali specialization specialization, specialization is quite is yeah. quite key uh that really struck home secondly ensuring that you know we're vertically integrated like she said supplying locally i mean sourcing locally how can mm -hmm. we keep all of that in here and the realities of all of these conversations today um, thirdly, would be, of course, where, where in, where, where's the opportunity? We see the opportunity, and I don't want to jump in because I'm, I, I, want, I want you, want everyone to, you know, because I know where our unique, our, our unique strength lies, you know, which if today we're unable to bring in experts flying the Bangladeshis or anyone from Pakistan, anybody to come here, which is what the government's been trying to do with manufacturing in terms of creating hubs is to bring the specialists in. In the absence of the specialists going to be able to come into Nigeria today, what, what is our reality? What can we do, you know, mm. on our own? What can we do? Yeah. That's what if we need to do. If you don't mind me, I would like to mm. say something concerning that, because, you know, I just, I wanted to answer your direct question. Earlier was why I didn't uh, mention some of the things that, um, you know, Auntie Jumake had said. So for me, I feel the first issue is to look even beyond the mask, beyond Corona, what, what's going to happen. Um, retail is not going to be the same as we know it. And to be able to sort all that, we have to start from the foundation, which is the knowledge, the, 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 the know-how. We, some people don't even know that there are other value chains in the industry. Some people don't know that they have to specialize. For instance, so in our industry, fashion, everybody thinks I have to buy a sewing machine, I have to be the one sewing, or I have to have my own tailors. Okay, now, manufacturing, contract manufacturing seems to be trending. Everybody wants to do that as well. Everybody's saying, I'm a hub, I'm a hub, I'm, I can produce for you. What happened to the other things? You know, I think it's time we begin to change the narrative and educate the people, first of all, on all the possibilities. You know, a designer came to me and wanted a particular type of zipper. I said, you can't get this here. If you're going to bring it in, one zipper is a thousand naira. How much would you sell your dress? Go back and design it without a zipper. There are ways you can, she could have designed that same dress without a zipper. So that's an example. So I think even for the educational system, the schools need to be upgraded. The curriculums are outdated. If they are mm -hmm. teaching them Absolutely. properly, you know, if they are teaching them properly what is industry relevant, we would have a lot of experts in-house. We wouldn't have mm. to bring in the Bangladeshi and the Chinese that everybody has been trying to bring in. Yes, because they have their own expertise, but Nigeria is still unique. We have a lot of experts here as well in their own specialized you know, fields. So I think it's right from the educational system. There is no single university single university offering fashion, yeah. designing, and all the related courses in Nigeria, none. No political. Can I just none. say that I, 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 sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but I really, really want to, to um, say that I fully agree with you, um, Shola, is it Shola? Yeah. Yes. yes, I fully agree with you because it's still uh, who is going to champion training these designers? What mm. is the plan with these? You know, in terms, like she said, the zipper, little things like that. The challenges that we have had with when we take on the local brands has been, as I mentioned before, basic things right down to aside from actually making the products, when they actually come into the retail stores, they struggle with the barcoding, the product identification. Yes. The, Information tag, the replenishment. You know, in the in, in the business, when you have broken sizes, we're throwing these sort of things in seventy percent sale. These mm. local designers, they come in already with broken sizes to start the season. 
the fashion mm. cycle, the season, all of these things are lacking because yes. mm. they don't have the training. They are not educated yes. enough to understand what's going The limited, limited range of products that we get makes it so hard for us to talk about merchandising. It's exactly. practically impossible to sell it unless you throw it straight into the sale. So this, what she said, I just wanted to, you know, um, speak on the back of what you are saying. It's exactly our issue. Thank yes. you very much, So the Ayo. international standards uh, can I come and in? across the yes. various channels have to be taught. And I think it has to be from yes. the government. You know, everybody has been asking who's going to Absolutely. Champion. It's the government. The government has to make fashion recognized. There's no longer what you learn. From you know us. what? I, I would disagree. Sorry, because Sorry I don't really think it's just the government. Go, yeah. I, I think government. Really <laughs> I don't I agree mean, either. Not yeah. just the what I mean is the accreditation. They, you know, all the billions, we know where they came from. And we need even the accreditation. <laughs> we need even the accreditation. I think we more, rely too we much on the government. Investment. Yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you know, it's a function of the government anymore. I think the government just needs to create an enabling environment. Um, I, I think, think yeah, if I may speak to that, that, that's what we need. Public public OK, that's, so when you want to export or you want to do something, they would ask you for your certification. So let, I mean, let, me, I would... let me speak to that a minute. No, but let okay. me jump in. Or let, me, let, me, let me speak to that a minute, because we're talking about an enabling environment. In a sense, it's both. It's a partnership. Mm. And that is actually why I'm here today. Mm. We need to listen to the sector and listen yeah. to the particular needs of the sector. There will be some mm. things that the yeah. sector requires government to have in terms of regulations and legislation. Absolutely. Yes. That's That's what, absolutely. Regulation, certification. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. But we cannot do it without the On, sort of without the the sector stakeholder. leading the way. When government tries to Correct. legislate or regulate a sector without the sector, it's a disaster. It is disaster. Well, I it, think is. That the it is. It the is. Sector it getting is. Getting organized. Mrs. Ogunlesi also spoke about informality. I think it was her. And the sector getting more structured. A lot of Absolutely. collaboration for yes. reform, for reform and for for rapid growth. A lot of a high level of trust and collaboration is essential. Yes. And they now are you understand. even on this call, people have different expertise, different perspectives, and that's where the sec the, the the sector coming together very strongly to identify the priorities of what to ask government for, especially at a time like this going forward. So. Through COVID nineteen and beyond, what and would be beyond. the priorities? What would be the priorities that this sector would see in terms of opportunity? And then the two, three most concrete, practical steps that are priority. If I can even just get two, three today, then at mm -hmm. least we know what. I'm more than happy to give you one or two that I think because <laughs> I've been waiting for this. It's like I've been waiting for yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, training. Yeah, you want to say something? So, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that. Uh, oh, sorry, he he's been waiting to talk actually, so I guess he should go first. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I want to comment on uh, what Shola has said. Actually, I want to welcome Dr. Dwale. Thank you, Omoyemi, for bringing her to us. We've been looking for her to her address. We're trying to get her in Abuja anytime we go. We can get her. The only reason why we can't see, can see, can see, can see her at all. We have problems. And she's supposed to be talking to us. Mr. So Kajafa. And she the she give us access. She give us access to her office so that we talk on all those things. Uh, Shola mentioned the issue of uh, there are no schools of. Uh, uh, fashion and garments design, all these kind of things. Uh, the government has schools, but the curriculum is obsolete. It's not that there mm. are no schools, but the curriculum are not uh, in tune with what the garments now have and the kind of machinery they have uh, in, in place. So all these, all these things have to be discussed with the schools to see to it that they update themselves, both curriculum and machine-wise, so that they can train the students properly. India doesn't have to be doing all this for us all the time. We have the facilities, but it's just the will from government side to uh, develop the curriculum properly. And I hope that should be done. About border closure, this border closure is temporary, and uh, the, 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 the smugglers or the uh, so called importers have warehoused their, their goods for, more than, uh, for up to three years to survive. So the border cl closure is just about two, three months now. So we cannot say, for instance, that it will create a great impact to us because uh, there are a lot of warehouses for smugglers. They have counterfeited our products and are keeping them in the big warehouses that can last for a year. 
So nobody will feel the impact yet. And uh, the customs, uh, the standard organization are afraid to raid this market. They don't have invoices. They, they over invoice and the invoice the uh, the products while coming in. They declare one container and about ten other containers coming to Nigeria freely, and they are selling this in cheaper. Therefore, making the tester to close. Now, now CBN has come to intervention to intervene in cotton production, but the cotton the cotton that CBN is selling to the testers is uh, is higher than what is uh, obtained in the open market. So if the intervention is uh, products are higher than the open market, then how is it supposed to make us competitive? Because uh, it, it will give us higher price and we cannot sell, afford to sell to the garments at cheaper price because the cotton coming to us at higher rate. So a government intervention should be, should be less. The cost should be less and uh, internationally competitive for the testers to come up and be able to sell at a uh, cheaper rate what, what they are producing. So, so many things mm. need to be done to bring up the CBN intervention to focus. Because they are not involving mm. everybody. There's no committee that is working on this uh, project. And there are staff who are not experienced in agriculture or anything about testers are the one running the program. Mm. So they need to put in more okay. people to sit down, form a committee in such a way that uh, this intervention will work. We are, we are not getting her. We are not going to get in the vice president office. So that they intervene in all these processes. What I understand is the directive from Federal Executive Council that uh, the CBN is implementing. And if they are not involved, they are not showing interest in what's happening at CBN, we will we'll not be working uh, at, at par. We'll be working at par with everybody, and then the price of things will be costly. So, uh, Madam Jumoke, you have to do something on these areas. And then uh, we have to work seriously. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank thank you, you for and now we can um, to Sorry, Omoyemi. Yes, please. Um, uh, I think it is important that we note that the government will not develop the curriculum, that we who yeah. are in the industry, who know what yeah. our needs are, we should yeah. develop the curriculum and show yeah, the I entire totally value agree. chain but the issue and is... all the job opportunities that exist within the entire value chain. Now, when people yeah, see those, I have done uh, such um, a those, those before, opportunities, I, was going, I gave it to the NBT. They said NBT they cannot Q. adopt it we, because yep. from an individual, it's not from it, the government. It's yes. so, so, so now, what now, we try now, to this do. This is why we need have to work together. Yeah. You know, the no, work collaboration the with the from a group. What, so I, what you can they say is that they need a law, a legislation yeah. that makes them. Uh, um, um, recognize fashion as, a, they still see it as a vocational skill training, something. That was the issue. It was from Fadan back then. It wasn't just me. You just, you just called it the terminology. This, that's this, what this, I mean this, by this the government is this. Right? I know the government cannot do a curriculum, but what I meant is the, uh, for the lack of the right terminology. The government parasitals or the government agencies. Of laws, the, sorry? So there are government parasitals or agencies the, that the, set so up if, for to instance, support the private sector to achieve After that maybe kind of this goal. group now, for instance, we come up with a, a curriculum and even list all the types of jobs and we present it to the government. That government agency is who I'm, I'm referring to. The government agency, yeah. in my opinion, does not exist. Yeah. But no, 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 to be fair, they do, they do exist. exist. This is where we need you to, okay? This is we absolutely they do exist. For they, do exist. Have, um, they do exist. Can I say something a minute? But they don't recognize us. Sorry, can I say something a minute? Let me, let me okay. say something a minute, Shola, because I think it's important that, you know, maybe you get a bit closer to government and how government works. So this sector, yeah, it's not now recognizing um, fashion or recognizing... It's a sector. It's yes. under manufacturing. It's a subsector yes. under manufacturing. And I just yes. told you how important it is yes. to the economy. So mm -hmm. it, it fits pretty squarely within, it has a contribution to the GDP. So yes. by definition, yes. it, is well, it is well recognized by every e economist and policymaker in the country, in the world really. It's a very important sector. And I told you some of the figures, well, I have them here, but I didn't tell you the figures, the amount of contribution in terms of GDP and USD yeah, we know that. that countries like Vietnam, mm -hmm. China, India, we know them. 
sub sector yeah. Yeah, to all, even the growth all, yeah. that we have in the Nigerian sub sector to yeah. the GDP. So it's not in contention, but it is highly informal. So if you compare it to a sector that is more yep. formal, so when you say government is not recognizing you, it's because it's a more fragmented um, yes, it needs to be structured. Larger contribution. My question is, who to... is going to do that restructuring? That structure. Who? But there's a, there's already there was a there was a council. Mrs. Ogunlesi was on it with the minister, the minister of state, the cotton textile and garments, a number of, of, of policy well, interventions we, and a number of discussions. So it's, it's, it's now to push through that lobby to the end. It's not about mm -hmm. sort of waiting for government with the sectors. And I'll just tell you this agnostic, forget I'm in government. Mm. The sectors that have a lot of traction are active lobbyists. And man, Manufacturing Association of Nigeria is a very active lobby of which you all belong by definition. Yes. Yes. So you're yes. already in the eye of the storm. It's just to be yeah. more Except organized. Except me, I who doesn't manufacture. I talked about okay. organization and, and, and productivity. These are some of the, the issues that I'm trying to see how we can come away with in a sense of how does the sector get organized for productivity so that we see that GDP percentile moving upwards. Yeah. So the effort yes, is but, translating uh, into. Yes. So, so, Jumoke, can I come yeah. Yes, uh, so, so, Jumoke, uh, yes, but, you ever wanted to say something? Yes. yes. Um, put him on hold man, for like. Man, 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 man is a general, 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 general on uh, uh, all manufacturing, and therefore their hands are full. You have to look at some specialized um, and associations like the textile manufacturer association where the garments are also involved because when man goes to you they talk of so many things so about uh, about 70 yes. sectors in their group so they will not be able to tackle our problem squarely that's exactly. why we register Very, we, yeah. register, di we register differently from a manufacturer association and you don't involve the small small associations that tackle issues of textiles and garments specifically and we when we want to knock at your door we don't see you so this kind of thing yeah, will have to go to the specialized <laughs> area. Uh, yeah, uh, specialized area uh, of, of, of the of the let me, and let me just, uh, yeah, but, Yes. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll just like to comment <laughs> on what everybody has been saying. It's actually quite nice to see that everybody is very passionate about this. Um, yes. What what I was going to say was that. Um, I think a lot of this conversation is something that people tend to have been having for a while, even in their, in their bedrooms, in their studios, in, in their living rooms. You know, this is something that we're all saying, you know, we want government to do more, we want government to do more. But honestly, I, I think I take the side of, of Dumoke here when I, when I, I think there is no body, there is no, there's no fashion body that is, that is presenting a clear cut, very, very well-defined kind of list of things that we want. If we were to go and meet a different group now and ask, okay, what do you think are the most important things that fashion as an industry requires to grow? It would be a very different set of things from what other people are asking for. It's like recently the, the CBN, you know, had this creative industry fund and then they had a fund for fashion and everything. And you could see that even just from the way it was structured, they were thinking more about brands that had a little bit more, um, that were, that, that were more established, for example, those are the, the stakeholders they had spoken to. But what about all the people who are setting up things now? What about the people who want to get into fashion education? I'm very happy that Shola mentioned mm. education because I also mm. feel like that is a major mm. component of all of this. One of the major Absolutely. problems we have here is that we don't actually teach in regardless of sector, it doesn't matter what sort, we don't teach our people, our young people, how to problem solve. What happens is that the average yes. Nigerian, and, and I say this including myself, the average Nigerian basically looks at something that is working overseas. So you look at Zara, you look at H&M and you say, I want to do an, I want to do an h and in Nigeria. And, copy. and then you now come here and then you now start shouting at the government to make all the environmental things on ground for you to build an h and But it doesn't work like that. You have to be able to say, what is, what is in my environment right now? What do I have access to? What don't I have access to? What Absolutely. are the challenges? You don't pretend that those things are not there. Mm. You, don't, you mm. don't demand and pray they are there. and say the government should come and wave a magic wand and fix all of them. You don't do that. You work within mm. the constraints that you have. 
the fact that Mrs. Ogunlesi is here and is one of the few, very few brands that are as old as she, as, as hers is, and that does what she does, is very telling. It shows you that very few people are actually really taking, it's not as if it's impossible, right? She, she's done it. So this is not to say it is not possible. Thank you, but I Yegua. I'm sure because I've spoken to her. Exactly. And I know that she acknowledges the problems that are on ground. She doesn't you know, wait for government to come and fix them. But if you come and if she now goes to government, she knows exactly what her problems are. She exactly. can say, you know what? <laughs> I, I need power, but you cannot solve power now because that will, that will cost like billions of dollars. You may not have that money now. Can you do something about this? I'm looking for really good pattern cutters. There's no school here that provides me with pattern cutters. Do that. These are the kinds of interventions we should be talking about. But I think fundamentally, yes, within the, our reach, the, 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 yes. this is it, yes. right? And, and, it, and it's a mm -hmm. slow yeah. process. It's not fast. It, it is. can never be fast. It it's is fast. It's going to be fragile. We, it needs mm. to be slow carefully done and it needs to be done by by the actual existence of these businesses i mean a lot of people want to get into fashion because of the glamour and the fact that Woo! it's very yeah. it, it looks really an amazing thing to be in it's very cool to see that you design clothes but there's a lot of stuff like everybody here has been saying there are a lot of different things in fashion that don't involve making clothes even they don't even involve designing can you be a fashion yeah. educator can you be a, a uh, digital merchandiser yeah you know uh, Merchandisers. So one thing I would say. So, we need to do it. Yeah. There's one thing we can take out from here. Mm. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about we talked extensively about manufacturing. About can we talk about retail? Yeah. So we manufacture all Thank you, Miami. <laughs> Where how do we distribute? <laughs> <laughs> what is the distribution <laughs> How are we going to do it? Are we telling I mean, from that both of our cars? Where yes, Auntie, and I want to tell you that I am on panel? the same. Is it you know where? How are we going to move the product? Okay. So, do you want to, to the, go I, to yeah. get to the point and, where sorry, to get right to the point this, where it's ready to be sold? Have, sorry, yeah. a lot of people okay. have questions. So after this one, we're going straight to Q and A from from our audience. Okay. So for for us, it's a very very structured business and it's structured on four pillars. Um, and it's people, um, the customer, the systems and the processes that drive the business, and of course, finance. Because without finance, uh, um, nothing else, nothing moves. Now for the people, it's a commitment to training um, the people that do come to work with you. Yes, I hear all the time, what if they leave? They will leave. You train another set, mm -hmm. it becomes expensive, uh, but then you have to ask yourself as a business, how do you retain the talents that you require to grow your business? And that becomes very important. Um, the workspace is going to change moving on. Um, the way we do business is going to change. Uh, and the way people interact with business is also going to change. Um, so we're going to have to find new uh, um, working arrangements um, that support what people need as well as the business needs. For the customer, there has to be more engagement. Uh, um, there's, a, there's been a lot of disruption. Um, Mackenzie says that nobody's going to be spending any money on clothing for, I don't know, 18 months or almost two years yeah. before we come out of this. Yeah, so what incentives are we going to have to give to our customers um, to help them uh, um, um, buy into our products? Uh, um, how are we going to improve um, customer uh, um, engagement, how are we going to improve customer experience uh, and how can we improve the product without necessarily uh, making the price higher. Um, for systems and processes, we will we leverage, a very highly leveraged on IT. Um, E-commerce for us is the next, is the way to go mm -hmm. um, because it, 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 you, are, it, you are able to reduce some of your overheads, especially the rental rentals of the malls that are in dollars and are so expensive, um, you have to re-strategize and re-examine re your business model. And for us, we, we feel that the e-commerce is going to be the best way um, um, to go forward. So how do we improve the experience? How do we improve the logistics, the delivery, and make that experience seamless for the customer? Finance, um, yes, there's going to be backlog of taxes to pay, um, loans to repay. How, and this is where we need 
policy to support small businesses to be able to uh, um, to be able to fund their businesses with working capital that doesn't cost uh, uh, um, commercial banking rates because it will be a big mm -hmm. problem uh, um, for the businesses. It will be a big problem also for the malls. So for me, it's how do we yeah. get this industry to collaborate and cooperate Commitment. in such a way that yeah. the entire industry survives, both the retail and yeah. the, 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 uh, the manufacturing technology. together. Mm -hmm. Now, what I can pledge is I, it's something I've been wanting to do. I will begin to run master classes on how to do barcoding. We do all of these things. Our entire business okay. is sitting on an ERP where we have visual merchandises, we have product merchandisers, they're all there. So we can, we can plan some kind of a masterclass for people who are interested in some of the different areas because this is a business that is running and has all these things at play, all working simultaneously. So we can run some masterclasses on how to do some of these things so that they can begin to go into the malls for Ayo to sell. Mm -hmm in her stores, talking, uh, teach talking them about, about standards. <laughs> yeah, so teach I them about, no, because this, really, yes. <laughs> really for me, for me, it's you, as driving. a manufacturer, I need multiple <laughs> uptakers, you know? I don't yeah. need some people with one store. I want you to mm. be able, I want to walk into a mall and I see more Nigerian brands than European or American brands. That mm. really for me is a success story. And that's what we want to be able to see. But to get to that place, we all need to be able to cooperate and collaborate with each other. And this is where I talk about the sincerity of intention of both policymakers as well as industry players, you know, that we, we come together. The first thing we see is we need fashion education. Let's create a curriculum. We create a curriculum and then these are the people that can train this curriculum. So, okay, they're, they're, they're designated or they're qualified or they're certified, if that's the right word. And they have the capacity to train you. And when you come out, this is who you would be. Textile, what can you make? How can you produce? We will not all be able to buy 5,000 meters of the same fabric. Can you do short runs? Can you do short runs? Can you do 200 meters, 500 meters? And so that up and coming designers can use these fabrics that are available locally. And this is how it starts everywhere in the world. And we how do we look tell inward. them? Sorry? Hey, okay, so you I take it back. The number one that, priority that, would be apparel. So the sector education, working with- Absolutely. The issue of education and-, mm -hmm. and um, institutions yes, to make sure that the output is fit for it will be a lot of vocational training i know lagos absolutely. state has yeah. absolutely yeah, LSE, LSE, yeah. LSE university. And everyone on this platform is already okay. doing some sort of training or the other training so so, yeah yeah okay so remember yes. i talked about scale and organization and someone mentioned certification that is recognize if you have a certificate you know what it means across yes. the country across the world so standards so I, i'd like everything to be thought of in in terms of scale and global best practice and something That's for the different. entire sector so if everybody's doing one thing or another how can all that come together and how can government now partner with the entire sector to have especially for for the the new up and coming i know somebody in, in abuja passionate about this, the Abuja Fashion Academy. So there are a number of mm. people that have this passion. So how Absolutely. can we get it together so that for Nigeria going forward, we can rapidly make sure that the training and the output, and we can all agree that this curriculum is fit for purpose for the sector, for our sector. And like if, if, I may, um, if, I, if, if I may, if I may, Jumokenna, Jumokenna, now that we have you here, um, um, we, we have been, we are, we are lumped with the textile manufacturers. The way I see it, our needs are quite different. And I think we have to come to the table with government to have this discussion that the needs of textile manufacturers and the needs of garment manufacturers are different. And we are collaborators. I think are different. We are collaborators. And the needs of, and don't forget the, and the needs of fashion business. Don't forget the cotton farmers. <laughs> Yeah, I, but I think again, we can, well, we can, you see, the textile and the cotton farmers can, can be together. But I believe that yeah, the textile yeah, manufacturers, yeah, the, the garment yeah, manufacturers, 
our needs are completely different because every time Mr. Kwajafa talks, he talks about textile, not us. <laughs> Mr. Kwajafa, no disrespect, you know, uh, uh, meant to you, but we really need to sit at the table. And honestly, we need to know what are your needs, what are our needs? And we need to have a voice for the garment industry, a strong articulate voice for the garment industry that can put forth what our needs are starting from this education to the government and we can get on with this, this whole matter. I totally huh? agree with you, know, Auntie, and especially the. I think you know. I wrote here a lot of the errors in the past. I really appreciate all the government is doing, especially the present government. It's a whole lot better, even before Corona, you know, started. But the error is also in the industry. They lump everything as fashion. Fashion is mm. different. It's not. Sorry, no, yeah. I, it's I, different I think need. we the can. Designers need is different from a manufacturer's need. But I want to go on to talk about the e-commerce part. For instance, sorry, I, I need a smaller story. About... Sorry, <laughs> I, I'm quite passionate about this. That um, I think we can organize ourselves offline, and uh, you know, so this there's valuable time, and we have quite a lot of people waiting for to ask questions. questions. They've been just over an hour. Um, so, Ayo, oh, can wow. you kindly, yes, Ayo, can you kindly let us share your thoughts on, on retail, the sector, and the future, and then we just wrap it up with uh, Shola and e-commerce, so we lead with bricks and mortar, and then maybe end with e-commerce, and then go straight to question and answer in like five minutes. So, the brick and mortar business. <laughs> well, um, I think after this COVID, it's going to suffer a little bit. But you still you still did brick and mortar plus the e-commerce. Now we have decided mm. to focus a lot more on the e-commerce, of course, because of what's happened with COVID-19. But the reality is these two work together. The situation yes. in Nigeria is that the online presence is not that strong. So as much as we may think that the rest of the world is, you know, moving away from brick and mortar because of the online, in Nigeria, you still have the same issues that have existed even in the past. For example, the uh, logistics, the warehousing um, issues, and all of that, you know, I think they've now stopped that whole cash on delivery. So this is still a very small percentage of, I think, the retail industry. So you still need the brick and mortar. Even globally, and, uh, in, even globally all the yeah. reports tell you that bricks and mortar is bringing in more money than e-commerce, but, you know. Exactly. And here. we are quite pedestrian in retail anyway, till even still today. We are still pedestrian in retail. So we are definitely, definitely there's still a lot more opportunity. 18 to 90% mm -hmm. of the retail market is informal. We still need to get away from that informal and get and formalize a lot more than what we are working on today. 90% of our retail industry is informal. The only way you mm. can get more and get to do all these things where you get the right people being trained from pattern cutters to designers and educating them is to create the platform and that formalized platform to use to work with these. That's where, you know, I don't know where Jumoke can um, come in really because without that, you're still going to have people on the streets just anywhere being maybe given funding or whatever and not really achieving much yeah and that's i guess that's the problem with the sector and to a large extent why the banks and and the government is getting i mean they're not tired but it's you know if they keep uh, funding the no sector, matter what happens after this uh, covid19 no matter how we do it we all now have to believe in ourselves and promote ourselves absolutely so with the funding that they provide, yes, they say they provide some sort of funding for the industry, for what, you know, the, the, I don't know, creative industry or whatever else there is. There has to be a way to make this more accessible. They not make the conditions as uh, unbearable yeah. as it is for people. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, like... Even so Shola, um, thank, thank you, Ayo. So Shola, you were saying something about e-commerce. E-commerce, yes. So... Um, right now, and I'm sure even after, you know, all the lockdowns, e-commerce will definitely be much more embraced in Nigeria. So I think a lot of people now to start putting in place a proper e-commerce e platforms 
people need to be educated in that area it means we're going to need more ict experts that understand the fashion so for instance the the copywriters how they're going to write the words for this fashion uh, uh websites who understands the hosting who understands so there's a, a lot mm. of jobs are going to be created so, mm. for going um, back to what Yegua said i think and it's okay. where people would not want to buy online but now that the cbn and all the banks are stopping are saying go go cashless i think we should start changing our mindset that e-commerce and people don't like to buy online in nigeria that would change when we all come out of this Thank you no, but much. I think the challenges with e-commerce also rest on warehousing and logistics. So whether yes, they like yes. a lot or of they jobs will come up. So there will be warehouses okay. in Nigeria. There will be people who drop ship. There are going to be people who just do packaging and deliveries for you, like what Amazon is doing. It's high time we tell all our youths and upcoming uh, designers to stop focusing on only sewing and look at all that value chain. I watched the lady who became a millionaire just by helping other people package their stuff and ship it out on Amazon. She is a millionaire and just doing that. So those are the things we need to begin to bring out to the, you know, to the public to see the other, you know, other parts in fashion that they can still work in. So I'm going to ask a question that's a follow up from, from this. This is now from the audience. Deloris from Wuka. Uh, sorry, there's a button. Uh, panelists, there's a button that says Q&A. I guess that's where we're at. Dolores is asking, how can we creatively incorporate technology into our collaborations? Can your investors create incentives to provide you all with access to new tools being used? So, um, does anyone um, want to I, answer where that? Is the, where is the question? John, yeah. So there's a Q&A button that's flashing. Um, yeah, yes. Is it the first I question? So I started from the bottom and we'll just walk our way to the top. Um, Dolores. Okay. 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 So she started by saying schools are not the only problem. People can learn on the job and also make money at the same time. Um, then she ends with, how can we creatively incorporate technology into our collaborations? Jumoke and Yegwa said, you know, we can not isolate ourselves. Fashion cannot exist in a vacuum. The apparel and you know textile industry and retail cannot exist in a vacuum without technology. So does anybody want to take on technology conversations? Yes, let me just say a bit. I'm not a tech expert, but I've you know based on past trainings, it's been that has been the direction for me. I love technology a lot. So it's high time we begin to embrace it. it People feel, oh, we don't have power. So how can you have a computerized machine? How can you be doing your patterns on, online? I'm one of the very few people that have the pattern making software or even know how to use it. So those are the things we begin to, we need to begin to open our minds that yes, we need to embrace technology. Power will be sorted. There's generator, there's solar, there's always an issue. So we need to um, engage a lot of uh, collaborations for, in my opinion, should not be with another fashion designer that's doing the exact thing you're doing. It should be with people who do not know what you do or who have something that you need. So for instance, I would love to partner with a tech guru, an ICT company. So that's, those are the kind of collaborations we need in the industry. So if there's an association of ICT experts in Nigeria, we should start to look out for them and begin to partner with them. Uh, yeah, but what's your that's their own the area of specialization. Instead of the designers feeling, oh, let me go and take a course on um, how to build a website. Because I see a lot of them doing that now. You, you uh, can't, I believe everybody strongly, has their own specialization. Um, so let's just I believe strongly that the industry is okay, lacking so. in education. And that's where another reason why we're still here. And uh, technology can be a useful tool to guide us. Um, so... Um, just to, just to, I mean, maybe, maybe this may be slightly controversial, but I, I think um, it's also important that we expand what our definition of technology is to being beyond just ICT, um, mm. web, e-commerce, yeah. um, digital kind of technologies. There's a lot of technology that is indigenous technology, that's uh, cultural technology that is inherent here. And it's something that we have, but we don't develop it at all. In fact, we, we run away from it, but... Um, what I mean by indigenous technology is um, 
I mean, to use a really simple example, something like Adira is technology, right? Um, something like the way, um, you know, market women come together to, to contribute money, to do something is, is, is also a kind of technology, the cultural technology. I, I think that um, there is a danger, there's a danger um, in looking to technology to be the solution for a lot of our issues. And I don't think mm -hmm. that that's where really we are. Um, I mean, a lot of people have been talking about e-commerce here, and I'm not saying e-commerce does not have any play, any role to play, but um, the majority of Nigerians, just by sheer numbers in terms of population, cannot actually access e-commerce. They either don't have internet connections, they don't have smartphones, they don't have computers, mm -hmm. they don't have debit cards, you know? Um, if the entire fashion industry, in terms of, and I don't, let, me, let me not just say fashion, let me say garment industry was to go like e-commerce first, you alienate, there's a huge swath of the population that's been alienated, you know. I think that um, one of the Achilles heels of the garment industry as it exists right now is that there's a very, very, uh, everybody is focusing on the same market. Everybody is focused on the middle to upper middle class. Um, and let's be real, that's a really small population, very, very small percentage of the population in this country. Um, again, not to say yeah, this, this, this is not a value judgment on anybody who is doing this currently with their business, but I just think that there's a massive amount of opportunity um, for people who are not in, this, in, in these income brackets because they also need clothes. And to be honest, that's where, if we look at the most successful businesses that we have in Nigeria, apart from oil and gas, that's, that is really where the success is. That, that's where the money is because that's where the population is. Those are the numbers. Um, mm. So I, I think that, you know, in, when, when we talk about in, in, in introducing technology our businesses and trying to be more innovative, I think some of that is also just about being able to look at how a lot of even rural communities, let me, let's, let's even forget urban communities for a second. How do rural communities clothe themselves? Where do they buy things from? What are the channels that get products into these places in the country, right? Um, a lot of Nigeria actually runs on a lot of informal uh, markets, a lot of informal economics, um, I mean, e economies, you know. So um, these things, like we, somebody mentioned uh, earlier, that it's, like, uh, it's not run on technology, you know, it's not run on ICT, it's not run on digital. It's, it's run on very um, kind of indigenous networks. It's run on apprentice, apprenticeship systems that have been long in the Igbo culture, it's run on a lot of um, on the ground innovation that is based on just being able to use your hands to figure out how something works or how something can be put together. And that's why they've gotten where they are today by mobilizing that technology that is inherent in our own culture. Um, a lot of businesses that are in garments, uh, garment production are either in Lagos or Abuja. I think it would do a lot of people who are interested in entering these businesses, regardless of what part of the value chain you're interested in getting into it, to travel more, to go to some of these places and see what people are doing in Nigeria with the resources that are on ground, you know? Um, I think that that's the kind of technology we need to be looking at more in terms of like um, cultural technology, social technology, as opposed to digital technology, because then digital technology now you start talking about power, you know? Yeah, thank, thank yeah. you, Yama. So that's food for thought. How, and of course that's, that's something that can easily impact uh, communities. Like you said, when we're thinking from that angle of rural urban development, it's at the rural level that they need the most support, right? So if we're focusing on that and how to empower them, it might be easier for us. Well, it's still not an easy job, but it might be relatively easier for us to begin to see some signs of progress as opposed to trying to tackle something we have no control over, we have no skills for, and we currently, and neither do we have the, the funding for. So um, looking at uh, what questions, does anyone have a particular question that they want to answer? So I'm not just the one reading this out. Okay, um, Adironke Jayola, I design and print textiles. If we can weave plain fabrics, printing on fabric is achievable with the right structure in place. Is there a way governments can support textile producers so we can achieve this? I personally feel that the textile textile producers have really enjoyed from the government. Like, so I agree, <laughs> I agree with Mrs. Betty, Shola, and I that you know maybe it's time to separate so that you know it, it, a, a bit more attention 
can 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 be focused on another part of the value chain. But um, another question on that: Does the government have plans to grow cotton farming in Katsina states? Lending rates, loans. Does anybody want to tackle that? Okay, I was hoping maybe Jumoke would have spoken to that. <laughs> unless unless <laughs> we're from Katsina else. State. Last time I checked, we're federation. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah, I... but state governments, I think it's a matter of most state governments. I work with, with all the state governments, and there is a reform champion for Katsina State on ease of doing business. So if there's a specific request, I can introduce them, and then they can take it up with the state government. But it's really a subnational issue. Okay, thank you. Um, to Ayo Amusha, how do brands that have actually attained said quality and global standards congregate in concept stores? There's a brand mm -hmm. stock gap that I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how to close. I've always wondered how there's no women's wear fashion retail chain store in Africa. It's mind boggling to me. That is a gap we're looking to fill. If there's stock is locally or in country that can make this an easier route to tow and start with would be fantastic. Is that a question? Oh, and then um, Jumoke, question to Jumoke, is anything, I'm trying to read the ones that's directed at a particular speaker. Is anything being done to capitalize on the manufacturing clusters in ABBA to build on the city as the fashion manufacturing capital in the world? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. So ABBA, I've been there, the vice president has been there. We've um, done an IPP in the market. We've uh, listened to a number of their constraints. It was mainly power, so that was solved about a year ago now, and that's going well. It's now about releasing really just the creativity, the energy, the innovation. They've not tabled another very main um, issue here. I've heard capital and the lack of targetedness of the funding interventions that are going out from government. Again, CBN is autonomous, but then it's good feedback to have. So ABBA, yes, in short, power was their main issue and it was addressed immediately because they're priority for manufacturing in the country. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, can, I, can I take a question? Yes, please. Yes, please. I, I just saw one that says um, on the issue of sustainability, what are the thoughts on hosting fashion week shows post pandemic? How do we creatively redesign this model? We already know fashion week fatigue has been a looming thing for a couple of weeks now. Um, this is by David Nwachuku. Um, I, I think mm. that um, even more than the fashion shows um, in general, I think there has to be a complete rethink of how the industry is structured. Um, one of the things that um, has really stood out to me in all of this is how fragile the economic system is, the international economic system is. Um, all it takes is just one small, well, not small, but one thing to happen and everything kind of collapses. Um, and part of that is because of how everything is built to be extremely efficient. You know, you want to be able to make even more clothes sell for more money so you can make more money every day, you know, this kind of nonstop um, process. Um, and I think that there's a lot to be said for what, how we internally in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole um, kind of produce clothes um, that we can look at, you know. Um, right now, a lot of our local processes and craftsmanship is pretty, um, well, you would say it's slow fashion because it's kind of like it's artisanal, it's handmade. Um, and there's a conversation about like scaling. Um, and, I, and I'm a bit wary of scaling, um, not to say one should not grow a business, but I think that um, there's a danger in this idea of scaling that means kind of plugs into endless scaling. I think one of the conversations that comes out from a lot of this um, post COVID-19 kind of stuff has to do with like what the world, you know, in terms of sustainability, you know, e ecologically for, for the planet um, and fashion shows if people start producing less, um, people start buying less, I think that fashion shows will have to be also 
happening few, fewer times, uh, maybe less often, maybe also, um, let me look at this now, there's a fashion show that's digital, right? You know, Woven Threads on a digital platform, I think we'll be exploring a lot more um, of these kinds of things, you know, when it comes to creating clothing. I was talking with a fashion designer the other day, and it really just comes down to asking yourself, what exactly does a fashion brand mean now in post-COVID-19 kind of era? Because um, there are a few fashion designers I know who are feeling like what they are doing is irrelevant in the face of this kind of health crisis, you know, in the face of this pandemic, it's like, oh, who cares about clothes, you know? Um, economically, mm. we're saying people are going to spend less money on clothing. So um, I, I think it really, you know, it, it's really a conversation about how many clothes are we producing? You know, fast fashion um, produces a lot more clothes than people seem to need because they throw away a lot of these clothes. Um, but it's part of the business model. It's what makes, makes sense. So I think now is an opportunity for us as a continent, as a country, um, and as a planet, actually, to be able to stop and say, okay, look, um, do we really need to make this many clothes? Do we really need to have how many seasons in a year? Some brands do six, eight collections a year. Um, do we really need this many clothes out there in circulation? You know, and if that's the case, then maybe you don't need that many fashion shows, you know, um, mm -hmm. 100 looks and this, this kind of thing. But I think that speaks specifically to like high fashion and runway mm, kind yes. of shows. And I think, uh, um, you know, in terms of just standard garment production, um, this is a completely different conversation. But I, I think both both types of clothing production um, really need to look at how many clothes is enough. You know, I, I don't think we need to jump into the same supply chain dependent system that a lot of these foreign countries have gone into because that's what makes sense economically for them, right? If you're if you're going to be making a number of clothes that Zara is making or H&M or LVMH group is making, then you need to go to the places that are making them the cheapest for you. And you end up concentrating your production in one place. So all that needs to happen is something can happen there and then everything um, becomes problematic. So I think these are some of the things we need to look at. If we're talking about producing locally, maybe we don't need to be producing at Bangladeshi scales. Yeah. Mm. Which brings me to the next question, which is quite interesting. Areta Muji is asking or saying, commercial waste from the West, AKA Okrika, is a huge issue. As long as these clothes are dumped on our shores, our people's shopping habits will never change. The average Nigerian is spending between 25,000 to 75,000, 70,000 on Africa yearly. This money would do well to be spent on local designers, thereby supporting the local industry. Um, it would be great to tie this into, and Ayo, you know, you and I had a conversation where sorry, we're like- I got cut off earlier. I don't know if you guys noticed. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry about so that. So I just came you. back on, so I missed what Yegwa was talking about, but you know, it made, most of it made oh. sense to me. Okay, where I, we've gone to the to the next question on commercial waste, aka Okrika, and um, okay. so I guess this question is for everyone. But uh, Mrs. Oduwale, can, can you kindly let us know if what the government's take is on on um, Okrika, so to speak? And I, you know, we had that conversation around um, all the mm -hmm. dead stock that's currently stuck in yes. packs around the world and where they're heading they're all heading down to mm -hmm. Africa once yes. borders are once borders open and all of that so there's going to be floodgates of you know all types of things that we as uh, especially people producing locally will have to deal with so um it'll be great to know and i'm mindful you know because i know that the second hand goods industry it, it's sort of still valuable in a country like ours where about you know half of the population uh, live at a certain at, at minimum wage level so it gives them opportunity to be able to cl clothe themselves and their families and all of that but how i mean will there ever be a restriction on this because we know that um if if areta is saying their average spend could be between 25,000 and 70,000. And we have um, government, uh, we have stores like from South Africa. And I believe that, you know, average price of what's mm. up, between 1,000 naira and 2,000 or possibly less. Will the government ever consider putting some sort of restriction? On <laughs> Do you think, does anybody on this panel think it might help grow our sector? You know, it might 
uh, a ban on importation of okweka or dumping, sorry, not importation, dumping of okweka mm. in Nigeria, do you think it can help support and boost the local uh, manufacturing industry? So let me, let me just say quickly before it goes to, to the sector that for government, it's really a matter of the sector asking. It's not yes. compulsory that you receive, but what's the lobby for the banning? It's not unique. It's not, dumping is a, is a trade, the global trade phenomenon and is a global problem. You have uh, automobile assemblers talking about used vehicles. Um, there's a huge dump discussion on technology gadgets coming to the country. There's a lot of discussion on dumping and banning. Dumping is a technical term for goods that are sold to another country below cost of production. So if you use the word dumping, it's a technical term and it's an anti-trade um, discussion and it's not allowed by international trade rules. So that's one thing. Anti-dumping is a whole different trade law. So it's, it's, a it's a technical language. But if you're talking in general terms, limiting inflow, you have this over and over and over as a trade discussion with local manufacturers and protectionism and fair competition and, and competing globally. It's a tension that exists across every sector. If this sector has a strong push and is able to meet local de uh, demand and is able to prove that and is able to be competitive and price points, then by all means, lobby the appropriate, that would be Ministry of Industry Trade and Investment and Ministry of Finance, by all means make a case for either increased tariff on used clothes or an outright ban on used clothes, but you have to come with empirical evidence that you can meet that demand um, across the country for all. This discussion has really leaned. I think Yegua talked on the bottom of, of the pyramid, which is where the skill is, yeah. and which mm. is where a lot of, like the money we talk about in those, in those if you had people on the call from the, the sector that import these okrika, I'm sure that the figures they're talking about will, will dwarf, will dwarf uh, a lot of the other businesses um, that, we, that we're talking about here. So, yeah, so it's to think about, you can only edge that out by blocking it with production and skill, productivity, man hours, organization. Those are really the way to do it. Not so much government lobby, Tomato policy went on and on. You know, there are different sectors that have had this tension and I've been in a lot of those meetings. So if you ban tomato puree, what happens to people that can't afford fresh tomatoes or when it's out of season? Um, you know, so it's not peculiar to your sector and it's a, it's a cogent question that has to be weighed carefully by, by government at all times. So Can I, I just say, I'm Lego. sorry. I, I, okay. Sorry, go ahead, Amoyemi. No, 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 please go ahead. Okay, I got cut off again. So I didn't hear everything Jumoke was saying, but um, based on the question that you asked, I think for as long as there is no plan on creating that um, environment or platform to reduce the cost of production or the infrastructure to improve the infrastructure for people to locally design, we will always have this <coughs> where they basically bring these products in as, lower, as low as possible. I had told you earlier that I have had, since COVID-19, I have had a few uh, brands and manufacturers contact me because, you know, to them today, the African, Africa seems to be the only, uh, the best open market now. It's the only place that is open that they can currently send the stock to so you can still get all of these things and with our international brands for example once this um the issue the, the virus started one of the first things that they started doing was to cancel different collections for different seasons and some for example puma can cancel the puma 360 meeting this is a meeting where we go and have picked uh, SS21, we pick spring, summer, we pick autumn, winter. So once that's canceled, it means that there's a lot of production, there's a lot of stock that has been produced that we, will, we the, French, the franchises, will not take. And so the stock has to go somewhere, even at below cost. So for as long as, you know, they, 
you know, at, at Kuma, it's not that great an example because you can't produce the sports goods here. But if you think about the other brands, for as long as we can't do these things here, there was always going to be some sort of avenue um, oh. for these things to come into um, our terrain. Okay. Even so I if think you ban it. I, I think I should quickly mention that mm -hmm. if we're fair to this government, a number of the challenges that have been known have been worked on. The amount of, of um, budget allocated to infrastructure development, all the roads being constructed, the work being done on the power sector, rail sector, ease of doing business, broadband. If we're fair, I don't think we can say that government isn't doing anything to make an enabled environment. Yegua made the point that it's slow. It's very slow, tedious work. But it's work that has been neglected for a long time, and it has to be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think we should yeah. also yeah. know that. I agree with you. We commend we commend government in many of the things. Yeah, yeah. Jumoke. <laughs> Particularly. No, the I agree with you. Um, yeah. organization that was given to textiles. Um, uh, but uh, actually, there are some policies that are not being implemented. Government chants out policies that are not implemented. Uh, for instance, there's a policy. Hold us yeah. accountable. Don't get tired of coming back to the line minister, coming back to the PEBEC, coming back to the agency in question. Don't get tired of it. I know that it's not your primary, you have your businesses to run, but yeah. that's why organized private sector is important. The officials yeah. should keep coming back. I know I can list, this week I've spoken to Man, I've spoken to Nasmi, I've spoken to Nasima. They're, they're organized private sector that are there to push that lobby continuously even as i've spoken to about my team and i over 200 smes okay. so we know the issues but don't don't get tired of putting that pressure on government especially when you've got a policy that you like that is not being implemented we at pebec we believe in listening we believe in implementing and then very critical we believe in tracking because it's only by tracking that you see the progress and the results and you can hold government accountable. Very well. But can we have your can we have your hotline? <laughs> Why we can always be talking to you? Hotline. Yeah. Sure, because sure. Uh, hotline. man, Nasi, you are not mentioning NTMA, NTGTA. So we need your hotline. Be uh, sending our messages to you. What Aisha Obaka has left to you, they have not been implemented. Uh, lots of things they, that was discussed at the CTG council you mentioned, and uh, a lot of points were raised. And I think it's only the gas recategorization that was implemented out of all the 18 points sent to you from the CTG. And uh, you know, like uh, the black oil is not available in Kaduna, the Kaduna refinery is not functional. So all the industries are, 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 are connected to the Kaduna refinery while they get the black oil. Now there's no black oil in the whole north. They have to come struggling to uh, some, somewhere in Lagos uh, or Port Harcourt. And then you can see the added uh, cost of uh, infrastructure, particularly transportation, from Lagos to Kano with the dilapidated road. So something needs to be done about uh, that area uh, while we can get uh, black oil easily. It's because true, now... you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, Omo yes, please yes. link us up. We'll, we'll take it offline, but you're absolutely right with that. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll mm -hmm. bring it back to the fore again. And talk about mm -hmm. all the cotton textile garment, all the issues we're happy to oh, take. That, that, that would be marvelous. Yeah. That would be marvelous. We'll, we'll take With it to the us. Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment and Yes, please. Yeah, and start trying to, to track and implement and we can take uh -huh. this bilaterally as we say. <laughs> uh huh. And our money on the uh, textile <laughs> development levy. The the any import of fabric to Nigeria, there's a textile development levy that is contributed annually. In 2016, about $4 billion worth of textile fabrics came to Nigeria. So 10% of that is supposed to be plowed to the textile industry for development. But that has never been done. Nobody works on that fund. We are not supposed to get interest rate from such fund. We are supposed to have a fund specially collected from that uh, textile development levy. 10% of $4 billion is a lot of money. So if that is accounted every year and put in a separate account for the textiles, we don't need to be worrying because uh, we'll be able to meet our competitiveness with other nations and be able to buy all the requirements we want. So, um, raw materials 
and uh, what have you, all the things involved, we should be able to get that phone directly to us. But nobody has worked on that phone, uh, Dr. Oduma Oduale. We need to work on those things and uh, see okay. how that money, that phone can be plowed. Because some have confirmed that they are still collecting the money from the, from the borders. So, and from the port, port authorities and the air, air, airports. So that money is supposed to be in somewhere in a sort of account for the development of textile industry, where the garments can get things cheaper. And that's the only way textile can make profit and be able to produce all the things that the garments are looking for. For now, so they're only concentrating, definitely not they're, a now problem, they're only concentrating, like they're only concentrating on Ankara, which is not good for the uh, garments now. And that's why no, the we were unable uh-huh. We will. We will. That, that, that's, that's one of the important things. We'll take it to this, the minister. We don't see you. Have we you don't met see the you, new minister? Have you <laughs> met the new ministers? <laughs> and that's why we'll take it to the ministers. Yeah, we'll take it to the ministers. Give us appointment now. So we will get the appointment. Give us appointment now so that we can see you. I will. We're all online now. I'll get you through my call. No, on a serious <laughs> note, I, I, I want to take this seriously. Way forward. We'll organize a call. You give me all the information. I will send it to the ministers, both the minister and the minister of state of industry, trade and investment and give them, of course, I know they've been briefed on all that was done before and then they can update. I'm not sure if it will be you specifically or the, the council itself, the cotton textile and garments and have a discussion on taking things forward with milestones. Mm. We just, yeah, with timelines. I think that's really how, how you can push any sort of reform forward. But yeah. if you left it well, since yeah. um, last administration, and then this is March, you can't take your foot off the pedal. Immediately the new ministers were inaugurated. You know they would have been briefed, but everybody's also loving them to prioritize their own areas. We need to get your appointment as well mm -hmm. and prioritize this issue. So we can work on this. Before we um, sort of, everybody, oh, yeah. yes, please. Um, I, you know, we focus a lot on um, the ease of doing business. And I appreciate that a lot of work has been done in that, uh, in, in that by Jumoke. I think one of the things we need to focus on now is what is the cost of doing business in Nigeria? We need to find an index that shows the cost of doing business in Nigeria because this is what is going to make us competitive. If we are not competitive, if we are, if we are not competitive, we are not going to survive. So how are we going to be competitive if the cost of power is so exorbitant? if the cost of diesel is so exorbitant. I think this is something that we must look at very critically so that we can go to Jumoke with solutions and ask for things that would support whether yeah. uh, um, tax breaks, whether yeah. uh, um, some kind of breaks that would uh, uh, enable us compete with whatever is coming from anywhere else in the world. So mm -hmm. I guess um, we're sort of, we we have to bring it back home. There's a lot of work that we have to do. You know, that's yes. how we started the conversation. Um, yes. We cannot go to government, private or public sector, without having a clear plan on how we're going to lobby together, um, map out a strategy for for a reforms, the reforms we want to see in the sector, the breaks we want to have. You know, and we cannot do this at a at an individual, as individual businesses. It has to be, you know, um, everyone coming together. We all know that, I'm, I mean, I worry that this might be, this might be something we've done. I mean, we've had these sessions for the last, yeah. since the Lagos Fashion Week's oh. inception in 2012, you know, it's just that I'm an incurable optimist. I never give up. I come back again and bring everybody together. Let's talk, you know, because I know this conversation is probably going to end, you know, we, Clearly, I, I like the way Jumoke has approached it. So, number one, we've discussed education. Seems like you know we have a we have a sort of map on on how that's going to happen. B, we've discussed. Um, there's been a, a conversation with Alaji on having a conversation offline where there's a call and follow up on what's going to happen. So, I want us to, if, if possible, to be. Able I, to I also saw Moya. I also saw targeted capital interventions. If the industry can give feedback to the government, 
in a structured manner on the, or, or commission a study on the efficacy of the capital interventions in the, in the, in the sector. So there are a couple of, of comments about the fact that the interventions, because you know that CBN is trying to help, but it seems those target, those, those interventions need to be more targeted at specific pain points so that the, the, um, the intervention is effective. So maybe mm -hmm. the study, the, the, the sector can also do a study on those interventions or call for CBN to do a study on those interventions for every Naira that has been given, what has been the return in terms of yeah. contribution of the sector to the GDP. Yeah. And I'd like to see, yeah. say to Ms. Lokumesi that funny enough, my team and I have been planning a cost of compliance survey. And fantastic. this sector is one of the sectors, yes. This sector is one fantastic. of the sectors. Uh, yes, with, with, uh, fantastic. Light manufacturing, tech, agribusiness, yeah. and creative. Fantastic. So you kind of straddle yeah. have to. To know, because I feel that when businesses come to us, they talk about pain points. Mm. They talk about a lot of costs, a lot of regulatory challenges, but it's not quantified in terms of where it hits the bottom line. You talked about mm. power. You know that you just mentioned two or three things, the cost of mm. diesel, the cost of electricity. When the tariffs mm. are, are, are when, when government is trying to make it cost effective tariffs, Mm. Organized private sector, I still had a discussion with uh, one of the DGs, still try to complain about tariffs going up. Well, businesses are spending a lot more on diesel and alternatives. So why don't we just have a power sector that works once and for all? So if we take it dispassionately and leave emotion and, and really break it down into mm. what the costs are and what the scenario, some scenario mapping, A, B, mm -hmm. and C, if we go with diesel, if we go with alternative, if we go with solar, or if Gas. we go with a cost-reflective tariff, if we go with an IPP, a national grid, what would be the best scenario for the sector? And the sector can easily, then you know what position you're pushing. If government says cost-reflective, this is what it's going to be, you know it's cheaper than diesel. And when yes. others are screaming, don't touch it, you know that for your sector, it makes sense to touch yes. it. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I would just push for empiricals, empiricals for government lobby because when sectors come to government and say government should, we need to, there's no specificity. So it then takes a lot to unpack the, the frustration, the emotions, the, the pain points, and to distill them into reforms that can be actually implemented and tracked with clear responsibilities for delivery. So I think that those are some good ways that we, we've agreed on today that can move the needle forward in a very so can, we, can we work way. with you can we, can we work with you on that oh yes yes definitely we, stopped, we actually only stopped it because at this point we didn't feel that we should be asking about regulatory pain points cost pain points in in a lockdown scenario so we actually yeah. stood it down on monday because we felt that right now we should be responding to agility, which is where we, we started from, and how yes. businesses can at this time manage um, their working capital and wage issues and, and restructure their loans, get some moratoriums. Yeah. So that's what we, we've been talking with businesses about in the last week. Okay. But we will do it. We will um, do it. We, we, would like, we, would like to we would like to join that conversation. I don't know where yeah. you're having these conversations, yeah. but I would love to be able to join it. Okay. Because I'm operating in the real Nigeria. Exactly. And again, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Odwale, <laughs> again, <laughs> again, again, that... Uh... I think we should start rounding up. So um, one last <laughs> yeah. thing from the speaker. We've taken so Stop much yet. of your time and the so time of the government government to up that, that been council. able to stay on the call the till council. now. Do we have a parting, you know, one last thing to say before we all leave? We already have a sense of our takeaway from the conversation and our action mm -hmm. points and our to-dos. We have to put our house in order and we'll come back to the rest of it off offline. Yeah. Um, but does anybody have anything to say as we round up? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Um, yes, sir. We can hear you. Uh, please, uh, I want to plead on uh, Dr. Duale that uh, the Council uh, of Textile and Government promised to the sector for a long time is yet to be inaugurated and it's not actually set up. 
because that's the only way you can get communication from the sector if we have that council in place. Okay. Council of textile and garment should be there for us to work very well. You know, the recommendation has always been there and up to now, nothing has happened about it. So kindly do something for that sector through the establishment of the council and let it be inaugurated so that we can work together and give you all the points required for the uh, development of the sector and progress of the sector. Okay, it's not, it's not my call to deliver, it's above my pay grade, but I will escalate this to both the ministers of industry, trade and investment and the vice yes. president as the chair of, of that Correct. council. Yes, Correct. so, so you, you came a couple of times to, to the state house. I will bring it back to the fore. I commit to doing that. Um, you. you know a lot Thank is you. going on right now in the country mm -hmm. and in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be an immediate thing, but I would definitely, definitely bring it back yeah, to the fore. Yeah, as yeah and as allowed, around the palliative, and the palliative for the sector. We sent our palliatives for the COVID-19. The palliatives are not yet stated. And have, um, have you written no. in? I should tell you that other sectors are already writing in formally. So I should yeah, leave that as that a parting through. shot to the entire sector. That speaks to the and issue of organization and structure. And I see here, yeah. At the textile, mm -hmm. the textile mm -hmm. uh, value chain side of things seems to be really yeah. pushing aggressively. So, Ms. Yeah. Ms. the point, and, and I think uh, OMI also mm -hmm. made that point, or was it yeah. Ayo, about textile yeah. seeming to get more out of government. You can see the aggressive, passionate yes. push. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, they, 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 they are okay. not taking care of the smuggling. The smuggling, no, 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 the smuggling. It's okay, I Mr. Madoka. You know, that you know that's why we are going to align with you. Since you know, it looks like textiles can, the textile sector can maneuver. We can no, pick yeah. you what, back. What I would say, I think there's strength. Okay. There's strength in numbers, and I think yeah. that yeah. you go in with one voice yes. and three, okay. three sections. So don't yes. divide. Don't don't go yeah. into not yet. Stop, stop. Going, uh -huh. going with one voice. Government, so government should have a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but have a voice That's and cool. agree. Cool. Yes, governments must have a voice. Beforehand, mm. so that one yeah. voice is not louder than the other. So you agree That's your good. position That's beforehand good. and you go as yes. one, because it got, it, it's not government that sort of bundled you yeah. together. As a subsector okay. under manufacturing, your bundle, mm -hmm. cotton is kind of agreed. Yeah. So cotton is kind of agreed, but yeah. textiles and garments and then and then retail is actually on a different so if we look at the yeah. economics of it and how gdp yes. is, is uh -huh. looked at but then that's for for us government to, to look at you don't have to really bother with that you just want to run your businesses correct, correct, but correct. you can see yeah. that there's no point uh breaking ranks just sure. agree on priorities beforehand and come with say two three four specific things that we can do first and track and then mm -hmm. look at things again and then go forward. Yeah, we so have I done that. We've submitted, um, so we we submitted our points to the Federal Minister of Industry. We have to round this up. Shola, do you have yes. any last thing to say? Yegua, Ayo, um, mm. we can, before, so we can shut this down and let people go yeah, and have Thank you. Mm. Um, okay, well, just a quick, uh, just a quick thing. Um, so it's two things actually. The first one is that, I think all this has been really stimulating. Um, mm -hmm. What we need, at least we've already kind of come to a conclusion that, you know, the next step is for garment industry to come together and actually have this kind of united voice. Um, Omoyemi is not going to like what I'm about to say next, but I think, I think fashion, Lagos Fashion Week is in a great position to be able, I mean, you, you brought all these people together, you brought all of us together. I think mm -hmm. there's something to be said for the possibility of creating some kind of platform that has regular, you know, meetings can develop these kinds of papers, and it's something that can happen from the bottom up. You know, as opposed mm -hmm. to because I think one of the problems is that there are a lot of solutions that come with this top-down um, kind of mindset, and it doesn't really take into account a lot of the problems that are actually on the ground. So it's one of the mm -hmm. things that I think uh, Fashion Week is in a great, uh, well, Lagos Fashion Week is in a great position to be able to do. Um, and the second thing is just to say for all the. Um, people who are working in the fashion industry or garment industry that are watching this and are scared, <laughs> worried about okay. what is going to happen to their businesses and their livelihoods in the next couple of months. Um, 
I'm not going to say it's going to be all right. It will be eventually, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge that it is going to be very difficult in the next couple of months. But because it is going to be difficult, um, we need to come together, um, not just as an industry, but as families, as friends, as business owners, as consumers. There has to be a coming together. You know, the, the, the mindset is always that we're in this alone. Um, there has to be an opening up of that, that uh, everybody can solve, you know, come up with things to be able to do and to be able to ride out this problem, this, this, this situation right now. Um, we started by talking about opportunities. Uh, Mr. Sobina was talking about the opportunities that are here and being able to leverage it. And there are opportunities. Every problem is an opportunity space. So I think that, uh, you know, in order to get there, no matter what you need to do, just being able to get that, you know, I, I've been talking to Moemi recently about centering and trying to just not be anxious anymore. It's important to get out of that, to be able to start dealing with these uh this, this situation that we're in. So if you're down right now, that's not going to be here all the time. Um, you're gonna feel a lot stronger soon. Uh, once you are, get into building, get into building relationships, building networks, approaching people, and uh, seeing how you can come out of this together. You know, you are not only a fashion entrepreneur or only a fashion <laughs> worker. You're a person that has a lot of facets, you know? So I think I'd just like to, I just like okay. to put that out there because I, I know a lot of people are going through difficult times now. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Can, Thank you. You. Can I just say something, Omoemi? I am, you know, just, you know, I obviously I will speak only from the retail angle of things. And what I think is brilliant is that you've got all of us together because it's, you know, as Jumoke said, many voices will sound loud enough and it will then be listened to mm -hmm. when you come together and you have a proper structure of what to do. What Auntie Nika said about educating. Education for me, I think is key in this industry. And exactly. from my, you know, from my angle, this is really um, so crucial for us to be able to develop the retail side of things, to be able to be more, more formal. What Antinika said about um, educating and running the masterclasses, I think is brilliant. Anti, wherever mm -hmm. I can do my own little bits, you know, I will join. But I think Game this on. is where if, if where if, at any point in time, we can get support with the education. Um, you know, it, it would be fantastic because there's so much, there's so many brilliant and talented, you know, people yeah. out there that, yeah. you know, if we don't marry all of this together, we still will be struggling with this industry. Mm. So, so um, Omoyemi, yeah, if, if I, I may. can also say something. Uh, uh, I would just like to say that it's never been a more important time to build trust uh, um, in our industry as now. If we, if we cannot build this trust, we're going to lose this opportunity. We have to cooperate, we have to collaborate, and we have to build this trust. For me, this is so fundamental and key. Thank you, as always, for, for bringing us together. It's been an extremely stimulating conversation. And in the words in the Book of Solomon, this too shall end and a new beginning will come. The question is, will we be ready? Will we be ready? We need to be ready. And the only way we can be ready is if we can stand together, because together we can do so much more. You know, so much more. Thank you very much. Yeah. My last word. Okay. Uh, can I comment on the education sector <laughs> issue? Um, we have so many schools, yet we are churning out graduates that don't have skills and to be employable. Now, if industry has to, again, go into training, they're not making profit, and then they have to go into training for skills again. When the schools are there, for all the years, these children have gone to school and they're not learning any skills. So something got to be done about the curriculum. Invite the Minister of Education here and talk to him that we should have a, a school that produces graduates that are skilled. Now, if we don't do that, it's going to be a problem. Because people are there unemployed and they are not being trained. And government is budgeting money for education every year. So what do we do with them? So we have to sit with these people, dialogue, and find the proper curriculum to be developed. And then these people graduate and we employ them in the industry without, again, bringing, of course, 
to the to the to the industry in garments and textiles. Yeah. So now that we are talking together, we have to see how we can liaise with the education institutions. Yeah, but college technology, uh, yeah, Cardinal Polyte Polytechnic, ABU, that are all doing textiles. And we have a garment school in Kaduna that is not being uh, utilized. Yeah. So all this needs to be put together and see how we can utilize this effort. Rather than each company, each individual training again, when you employ. It's another added cost. We have overhead high it's overhead cost. cost. It's, it's uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, oh, you, see, you see all this needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Shala, your last words as we round up. Yeah, my last word is um, two things. My contribution. So I'm pledging, like everybody who knows, through my school or any collaboration, to be able to teach what I believe is the standard thing that is industry accepted and unique to Nigeria. The world is, has changed already. So we're not, I'm not going to talk about what should have been done. Moving forward from today and thought, we, I already have um, a curriculum that we teach and also has been adapted to embrace the change that has happened now. So I'm pledging to be able to partner with, you know, or anyone who would be able to get it across to all those who would need it. And to all the designers out there and manufacturers who are still uncertain, for me, I, I have always risen from every challenge. We should see this as an opportunity to go and rethink. I wrote something down. This is the time to develop new products, new services. There is so much. I have written over a hundred new um, opportunities out there. Wow, so girl, you, you have a lot of energy. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you, whenever there's a problem, I'm, I'm a solution provider by nature. So when the problem started, I just started thinking, what's the way out? What's the way out? And that's why for me, I have not been down at all. Uh, we, 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 even though we're closed, we're getting orders. So, but anyway, I, and I can share that with you and the association. And also, you know, people should focus more on faith, the happy things. Let's not I heard today of a designer who, who almost is insane now because she's had some mental breakdown. People are afraid of what, what's going to happen to this way I've, I've been known. So it's time to well, just embrace it, it, it's real. the change. It's real. So, um, I mean, I'm going to end on this note that we're not trying oh, to- oh, I mean, Sorry, sorry, before you end, I think it's important that, I mean, I sort of said where they could be found, but back to COVID-19 and the government's yeah. efforts. I just shared some, some were in the Mr. President's speech on Sunday. All the seaports are open. So imports depending, they will continue. When it comes to the sector, even in terms of hospital and related medical establishments, under that A, there's healthcare related manufacturing and distribution. So definitely the sector comes into that. There's some FRS concessions that have been announced and some CBN interventions, including the NICEL role, 1 trillion Naira loans to boost manufact local manufacturing and production across critical, critical sectors. And that's also on our website. So there are a number of interventions. It's never enough and it's just started. We're also working on another sort of stimulus package, but government is also trying to balance revenues and oil prices, and, but good news, Price of oil moved up 10% yesterday. Russia and, and Saudi have reached uh, an agreement. So mm -hmm. let's not leave on a hopeless note. I know that's exactly uh, <laughs> where we're getting to. But let's no, know that. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's stuck at home. Let's leave on a yeah. good note. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let's yeah. come out stronger for it. And I love what Shola said. Let's use the opportunity to develop new skills, to touch base with people, to learn new things. To, to challenge ourselves, our creativity, that agility is important. Mm -hmm. And I say with this in, in terms of our businesses and our strategies and our works and our planning, let's be, mm -hmm. be resilient. That's what Nigerians are by definition. Yep. So this will not yep. be different. Thank you very much, Omoye. Yes. We have enjoyed this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank else. you. Yeah. Um, Thank I'm, glad you. I'm happy we're living Thank on this. So much, 
and with a clear focus of, on, on what the future or where the future lies. And hopefully we can all be able to connect offline as well and begin to answer the questions that a lot of people have for us and to be able to report to them hopefully in six months and say that this was, you know, these are the outcome, outcomes from that, you know, two hour, two hour, 22 minute session that we wow. have. <laughs> You know, we're going to um, hopefully, as we all leave, look for a way to find time offline to come together and do all the do all the things that we said we will find time to do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if Thank anyone you. out there you. wants to call or you're trying to reach out to any of the speakers, kindly let us know and yeah, then pick up from there. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Well thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Amaymi. So brilliant. Thank you very thank much, you. Amaymi, for doing yeah, this. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. And everyone thank you, everybody. In. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.